Today we have with us Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, former judge of the Supreme Court who demitted office on 25th December after serving for 22 years in the judiciary. Justice Kaul was elevated in the year 2001 as a judge of the Delhi High Court. He went on to serve as the Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court as well as the Madras High Court before being elevated to the Supreme Court in 2017. Justice Call has authored many celebrated just judgments besides being on the bench, benches actually that have uh, delivered significant rulings with the latest one being on Article 370. Thank you so much, Thank sir, you. for uh, joining uh, and being with the print. Uh, since Article 370 judgment has been one of the most significant verdicts which you've delivered during the last uh, leg of your uh, career as a judge. My first question to you would be on that only. The verdict has actually sparked a lot of criticism with many people saying that, you know, it disturbed the concept of federalism, which is the spirit behind constitution. How do you respond to such uh, criticism? And an added question is, that some of the criticism came from some former judges. Is it okay for former judges to comment on a Supreme Court judgment? So I have been uh, doing judicial work for 22 and a half years. I think before I write and I've had no regrets about what I write. Um, and I believe what I wrote is what should be the law. Now, there are many uh, problems which have uh, a social legal context hmm. and they uh, are debated and come in different forms. So I would write some judgments where there would be another section which would be unhappy with it and the section which is unhappy at the moment would be happy with it. But that's not our job to keep uh, the either the legal fraternity happy in that sense or the different viewpoints happy in, in that sense. Uh, these, these will naturally bring some element of uh, difference of perception. Some people who don't agree with it are entitled to their perception. And um, it's a unanimous view. It's not even uh, where uh, I have taken a view or somebody else has taken a view. It's, it's almost a unanimous view of the five senior most judges in the court. Uh, I don't think um, it's a matter on which federalism in the larger context is going to get affected. Uh, Kashmir was a standalone case in the context of the special provision made under Article 370. The view which we have taken is this is a, was a temporary provision. I have written also on the aspect that over a period of time, uh, it had uh, almost become some kind of uh, uh, skeleton alone. Yeah. Most things were gone, but it was perceived as something still subsisting. And what has been done last is to remove that bit of it. And the very uh, provisions under which it uh, came in, and the chapter under which it came in the constitution, it is uh, my belief that this was meant to at some stage disappear. Mm -hmm. Given the environment, it has disappeared today. What stage it should disappear is something which is a political decision. Okay. And therefore, that's not where we are stepping into the picture. Coming to uh, the second aspect you said, should um, uh, a retired judge's comment on it, it's a very individual, uh, uh, I think, thought process of somebody. I'm not perturbed by uh, whoever it may be having an opinion on it. Ultimately, that's an opinion. Hmm. We may have a different opinions. Today, they stand and have a different opinion outside. As a common citizen, uh, it's not something which will trouble me about it. You're right. Coming to another important verdict, um, that is the same-sex marriage, which is related to the same-sex marriage. Of course, we saw a difference of opinion emerging, uh, you know, in the bench. You were also a part of the bench that authored or delivered the right to privacy judgment. And uh, from that judgment emanated several other cases, you know, that uh, talked about uh, restoration of fundamental rights. Uh, which also included reading down of Section 377 of Indian Penal Code. So the same-sex petitions were actually a follow-up to, you know, that mm. judgment. It, uh, I mean, <laughs> did not uh, result the way the majority of the people were really thinking it to be. Any, any take on that, sir? So the privacy judgment opened certain avenues. Uh, you are right that uh, largely after the view which uh, in the privacy judgment, the judgment authored by uh, the present Chief Justice took and I in a concurring view took. 
uh, five judges had already held on an aspect of decriminalization, yeah. uh, reading it as part of privacy. So it was more of a formality, I would say, the final judgment which came, mm -hmm. uh, restricted to that aspect alone. But it's been a it's been a social moment forward. It began with a scenario where uh, in 2001, originally this petition was filed. I happened to be on the bench and notice was issued in this matter. Uh, my, my senior partners thought that I should not be over enthusiastic about it to immediately take it up because there is a certain process of social changes which take place. Yeah. Sometimes law uh, uh, initiates social changes. Sometimes social changes initiate process of law. Right. This was a case where uh, there was an endeavor to change the social thinking process. We can't get away from that. And it took some time, put a history to it, it got dismissed in limine, went to Supreme Court, remitted back uh, before a bench which, which took a view which I would tend to agree with, Supreme Court different view. So if you see a number of years, 2001 onward, um, what almost two, two decades, decades passed yeah. before we finally came to a judicial conclusion and the government and the citizenry also accepted it. Here we were moving a little forward. We were giving a status of a of a marriage. Even the minority view could not adjust the marriage concept within the ambit of uh, uh, the Special Marriage Act. Yeah. So I opined that well, it's a different form of it. It's a social union on the on the other side of the coin. The idea was to give um, in society a recognition to this section of society who may have different. Uh, sexual preferences did not muster a majority it happens at times uh, it doesn't mean that law will remain static it only means uh, the government may a couple of years down the line consider it it is possible the judicial view may change hmm. so uh, social changes in the process in which they are taking place have their own nuances hmm. and i think a time will come i feel when the opinion should find favor. Uh, I believe a judge's view is only an opinion. Uh, it, it may carry forward tomorrow, it may not carry forward tomorrow. Somebody may hold a different view and we should not be touchy about either the opinion or the result of it. Well, so you've spent all uh, about six years in the Supreme Court. So my next question would be related to the institution itself. You know, a couple of years back, we had a press conference in which four judges spoke about lack of transparency in the listing system. It actually came as a, you know, it really shocked the, the fraternity and the judicial community. So do you think uh, that that conference has actually yielded any positive results? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is because recently you had expressed concerns about deletion of a particular case, um, which was listed on a particular date for hearing. What is your opinion? I I spent almost actually seven years. Yeah. I think matters must be sorted out within the system. A lot of people say, okay, they should be like a glass house. The judicial system's working cannot be like a glass house. Transparency, yes, it needs transparency in the system. Personally, I don't think that uh, going to press really helped anybody, hmm. uh, except uh, causing some disturbance. People really did not understand why four judges went to press. This is another challenging aspect because everybody doesn't know how the legal system works, how the uh, um, sitting of roster system will work. And so far it has always been the preserve of the Chief Justice. Hmm. Um, let me ask a question to myself. Is it not expected then when somebody through the lines reaches the highest office of a Chief Justice, we must expect uh, a reasonable um, approach to how roster should be framed. And if there are issues, it should be debated within. You mentioned about a particular case. It was before me. It was mentioned before me why it is not listed. I left it to the Chief Justice to determine how it was not listed. When will it come up? If it comes up later. I'm sure it's an issue which uh, somebody sometime will uh, carry on the task which I was carrying on. Nobody is indispensable in the system. Mm -hmm. Somebody else will pick up the baton as it happens on on the judicial side. One case goes uh, through at times different benches. One thing goes through people retired them at office and others take it up. So I'm sure the issue will be addressed at some stage or the other. Yeah. So you were on the judicial side also hearing a matter related to judicial appointments. Uh, 
So there was a little bit of criticism uh, over that with people uh, saying that, you know, since you were a part of the collegium, you should not have taken it up on the judicial side. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? So, you know, it's, it's rather peculiar. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time when I was taking it up, uh, there were there were some some voices being raised that uh, I not being part of the collegium system <laughs> should not be hearing that matter, as then told to me by the chief justice. Yeah. Maybe there were some concerns in the government or otherwise. Now, if I take it as part of a um, collegium, uh, some people will say, why do you take it as part of the collegium? So somebody has to be either a part of a collegium or not a part of a collegium. What were we determining? Uh, the three judges then, headed by Justice Bobde, really laid down timelines. The need for laying timelines broadly were felt because there is a delay in the system which was having an effect on both the appointment process of the judicial system as well as ability to get people to accept judgeship. You know, it's a, it's a great challenge I think today, especially in bigger metropolitan towns uh, and successful lawyers to ask them to make a sacrifice because the monetary sacrifice has become quite large. And I think judges are better off than they were a few years ago, at least till when I joined. But the legal legal fee structure has increased uh, phenomenally. Phenomen, yeah. So you have to give them that honor which is necessary, I think. That is, you invite person to the bench. That's how I always looked at it. And therefore, the process must go through smoothly in that. Uh, so one is the monetary sacrifice. The other is the manner in which it is offered which is creating, I've said openly in courts also and outside, creating a problem in getting the right kind of talent uh, onto the bench. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, one of the things uh, which had uh, trouble. You know, uh, who is responsible for this, sir? Because there is always, you know, the, the, the judiciary and the executive have been at loggerheads on the issue of appointment. Mm. Uh, judiciary sends names to the government, the government sits over it. Or, you know, they, they kind of send back names with very lame uh, reasoning. So how, how can this problem actually be resolved? Because the criticism over the appointment system being totally opaque is, continues to be there. It, and is, it has been there for a number of years now. So let's first understand the system. Three judges of a high court get together and make a recommendation from the high court. It's not that one fine day they'll suddenly get up and say, okay, we've decided ABC is to be judged. I've been a, a chief justice for almost four years in two courts, long tenure, and, and have made recommendation in, in Punjab, I, Aryana, I made recommendation, 16 recommendations, 14 appointments took place. Hmm. In Chennai, I made 60 recommendations, 46 recommendations ultimately fructified. You do uh, across the board search. So you consult... Uh, before consulting the collegium, you also consult some other judges who may know about the subject. You talk to lawyers, that's how I did it. You get an informal view of the IB also. And then you try to see how it works out. And there's a, aspects, uh, especially in a place like uh, Chennai, of social representations. So you look to the whole thing, try to pick up the best talent, make a pool of talent and take that pool of talent into the, uh, uh, the collegium. Hmm. Some of them may have their own views on it uh, in the collegium system and then a consensus builds up. So it's an elaborate process. We don't stand on a podium to do it. Yeah. It can't be done. Yeah. Um, then the names are recommended. Uh, the list goes, one copy goes to the Chief Justice Office and another to the Ministry. Uh, before that, the views of the state government are taken by the, uh, included in that dossier. Um, it goes to the government, which gets an IB report. Uh, the IB report is incorporated. The government has its own feedback, which they claim beyond IB also, hmm. and they comment on it. And then finally, that composite file comes to the collegium. collegium. In the collegium, three senior most judges of the Supreme Court sit on it. But it's not just like that, because there are judges from that court who are in the Supreme Court. They may be, have been chief justices of that court, or they may have been judges of that court. Their inputs are taken. So the consultee judges, what they are called, their opinion also finds a place. It's after all these material that we sit together. I can say during my tenure of almost 14 months in the collegium, we also do our separate research sometimes. Hmm. For example, if there is a negative aspect, it's possible it may be correct. Sometimes there are motivated actions. So we do search from trying to find out from those uh, Judges 
from those codes which we may know, there is a little subjectivity to it. We do a wider area. If IV report is, is sometimes adverse and we are not satisfied, we have at times referred the matter again as to what is the specific input of the IV for that. Hmm. At times we have referred it back to the High Court Collegium to get their view on certain aspects. This whole process uh, can't occur, you know, just outside. If the process is there, so it is not opaque. What does opaque mean? Does it opaque mean uh, that you stand outside and do it when an uh, empanelment of a secretary in government of India takes place? Uh, is it opaque? There are processes. Mm -hmm. We do have processes and that's what is important, I think. Mm -hmm. We go through these processes and then make the appointments. Yes, the problem has been that the, the whole collegium system was a judicial uh, interpretation. Yeah. So the criticism has been, it has not been part of the constitution. It is something else, what about it? I would say there were exigencies and situations whereby judicial experimentation was done to bring the collegium system in. It worked well for a long period of time. Hmm. There have been problems, I must accept, in the working of the collegium system. Not because the collegium system is bad, because sometimes we may have uh, failed the system to some extent. Um, the, the post of a judge, to my mind, is not a post for my, my relatives and friends. Right. It's supposed to be determined on certain parameters. And uh, when, when going through the processes which are required, uh, ultimate selection has to take place. If there are things wanting, criticism is bound to come in. It has also happened at times that you do your best and the judge doesn't turn out as he should. Hmm. I face this scenario. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, sometimes you expect an X level from the judge and the performance is far above even that. Mm -hmm. Those situations also arise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a problem and problem arises from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, what I call at times, Judgeship not resting easy on the shoulder. These are problems which are not unknown, they arise. That's how, in a way, transfer policy also arises from other reasons. That, you know, uh, you give a little bit of a push, give a different environment to see how the person works. So, all this process uh, is something which is, uh, which is quite uh, intricate in its sense. The political system and the uh, criticizes it because the entire parliament got together to pass the NDC Act. Yeah. And they feel that, look, once we pass a law, how can the court uh, strike it down? Yeah. Well, the point is the court is the arbiter of any law. Um, my own personal belief is that somehow this uh, National Judicial Commission got uh, finished off before giving it a chance. Uh, so, you think problems. it should have been uh, I think tried it and deserved. tested? I okay. think it should have been tested. Because many been. of the judges who actually authored that judgment, uh, quashing yeah. NJAC, <laughs> after retirement, they actually yeah, said yeah, that it should have been tested. It's too late to do that. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, my personal view throughout has been, it deserved a chance. Maybe the matter could have been kept for some time to hmm. how to tweak the system. I felt it needed tweaking. The judicial predominance must prevail. Mm -hmm. The real problem was whether it should be a five member or a six member. Uh, it ultimately was six members, so there would be a deadlock in a threes to three. It could have been, now I can say tweaked. My view would be that if the Chief Justice would be given the, prom the predominance, mm -hmm. then the deadlock could be broken even in threes to three if the Chief Justice is given a predominance. Yeah, okay. Another important factor would have been a discussion across the table, no uh, backroom discussions. So the executive and the judiciary and the, the colloquium would sit together and decide who has to be appointed. And after that, there should have been no if and buts. Once the, it was cleared, the appointment should have taken should place. Have taken place yeah. I think given what is happening today, a lot yeah. of this could have been avoided. Okay. If we had uh, experimented with it, tweaked it, uh, made it in a manner more suitable, uh, this, this battle which is continuing, this resentment on the part of the government that this law was set at naught, and jud judiciary saying that, look, uh, we will control the appointment process, has left much to be desired. Do you think? Do you see this being resolved or getting resolved in, in any time in near future? How is the resolution possible? So, some sometimes I'm asked, is it a can it be done a MOP? I don't think MOP can do it. Mm -hmm. MOP was a, a post thought process okay. after having stuck down the law to mm. bring a greater transparency. I mentioned I don't think there's a lack of transparency. Uh, in the in the way judges' appointment takes place on the judicial side, 
but government has its own perspective yeah there are some names government may insist upon and and we are very clear can't get through mm-hmm. on the other hand we are having a scenario where government is not letting some names get through mm-hmm. so you have a, a second reiterated name spending you have a first time name recommended not sent back but held on mm-hmm. so the appointment process is in a problem i i have no doubt about it uh, we are as it is working with far lesser strength than, than what, we what we should have, should have. and by this process uh, how will vacancies be filled in yeah um, actually i feel that it will take time to fill in the vacancies and for more reasons than one if the high court judges age would to be increased, increased to, uh, to to what the supreme court judges is match it match it. not increase the supreme court judges okay age. so match it then uh, those three years period would be available to fill in the vacancies knowing the process which goes also this whole whole rush and push and pressure to Uh, at time which is felt uh, to appoint to supreme court also the feeling if you ignore somebody senior it will be reflection on him uh, it's not that the supreme court judge gets anything more than what a chief justice of the high court gets in fact i wanted to ask you uh, about appointments to the supreme court you know because it is often said that there is no set procedure or the criteria uh, as far as the criteria is concerned for elevating a high court judge to the supreme court there is no fixed criteria you know sometimes particular judges um, elevated because he's a senior or sometimes he's elevated because uh, that particular high court doesn't have enough representation in the supreme court so that also kind of has led to a little bit of you know discomfort amongst the high court judges there is the element of subjectivity which i can't ignore um it arises from the fact that seniority is one of the factors only representation from that court is another factor sometimes there's nobody in, in the wisdom of this collegium who they think at the moment deserves to be elevated um who is going to be future chief justice is an aspect which is taken note of um then you have uh, uh, the representation of genders you have representation of uh, of the dalit community or the backward community so mm. without a reservation there are many thought processes which go to Hmm. balance it um uh, and there's a government role certainly i can't hmm. deny the fact that there's a government role in it hmm. okay can you just explain it a little bit what do you mean by saying the government role so the government has suggestions hmm. and they come up before the collegium hmm. uh there are at times very good judges but the government has been adamant on not appointing them hmm. that is also occurred okay so both things have occurred it's not nothing new actually if you we just go back to 1950 onward hmm. it's the same scenario Okay. I think nowhere in the world will the government accept that it has zero role to play in the appointment of the judiciary. Okay. In most cases, they do it. Okay. Now, we the judiciary having taken it away, the push is always there uh, okay. as, as to who should be appointed, should not be appointed, and uh, it would not be fair for me to say that you know just the collegium sits and decides. That's not how it works. So, talking about transfers, recently um, a judge of of a particular high court said that you know his transfer. indicated shifting of power from the executive to the judiciary so do you think that the judiciary has assumed to itself uh, more power than what is granted by the constitution when it comes to appointments and transfers particularly transfers let's so appointment i've dealt with yeah, transfers no i who is going to judge how a judge performs uh, i believe the the judiciary is much better in a position to judge that once appointment has taken place it is my view that the government has very little role to play in seeing where a judge should work hmm. and for that also there are certain norms on how many times you can be transferred what is the reason uh see there is no other method prevalent at the moment it is as i said one case can be non adjustment to your parent court or whichever court you are hmm. and it is felt that a change of environment may improve the situation uh sometimes the working of a judge uh, leaves something to be desired there is no other method of check and balancing other than a transfer unfortunately we we don't have any a workable impeachment system mm-hmm. which works so it is not that in all cases where transfer takes place it takes place because as it perceived that is there some integrity issue raised mm. there are many many issues on which it is raised there are cases also where judges volunteer or they are persuaded to go out because you want to strengthen the court or somebody will has a longer tenure so can spend some time in the other court or his his performance is so good that you feel that if he is at a senior position in another court uh, it will be better for the system 
Of course, I believe it can't be, there has to be some balancing. Right. You can't have a scenario because every time a judge is transferred, it blocks another post in that court. True. So this balancing must take place. But transfer is some issue, I think, will have to be left to the judiciary. I, I Prince, unlike uh, appointment process where I feel government has plays a role and will have to play a role, in transfer matters, it is uh, should be the judiciary's call because you are determining where that appointed judge is best suited to carry out his task. Okay. So, seven years in the Supreme Court, any key takeaways from your side? So, the Supreme Court has, from a constitutional court to some kind of an appellate court, it has become a court for everything. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's not being fair to the working of the Supreme Court. Um, it's sometimes the right thing, say a bail matter, let us say. So there are different reasons. Is it that district courts and high courts are not giving bail so that they're coming to Supreme Court? This is something I would say yes, and the court has been saying, because the interference level is high. Hmm. Uh, I can't pinpoint the reason why this is happening. We have laid down law on a number of occasions um, on, on this aspect. Then we have these, uh, you know, a question of how many tiers of independent judicial scrutiny should a matter go through. Okay. I believe two independent judicial scrutinies are enough. Suppose there was a, a court above Supreme Court, even our orders will get set aside. So we, there has to be a restraint at each level. And what I often call is the mariada, uh, jurisdiction mariada. Okay. So each jurisdiction has its own mariada. And it has to be followed at whether it is in a revision case, writ case, Supreme Court. So everything can't be taken up by the Supreme Court. The dismissal rate on the admission day itself, I think, is somewhat a reflection of what happens. But you have to read it. You have to take it you through. Take so, so Monday and Friday goes in this. Yeah. Maybe there is a necessity to think that can we lay down norms uh, so that they, there is a general awareness hmm. of uh, what kind of cases effectively the Supreme Court may be inclined to uh, entertain. There can't be a hard and fast rule in all this. Then we have a number of uh, statutes now where direct appeals are coming to Supreme Court. Okay. That is also uh, proving to be another challenge. Mm -hmm. So you, you and you have specialized acts, electricity acts and others. Should all this come to the Supreme Court is the question I pose. Okay. Uh, would it not be better if there is a scrutiny by the High Court of this? And it ends uh, there. And, and, and it ends there unless and you do process because this, these are treated as second appeals to the Supreme Court. Right. So, uh, intrinsically the Supreme Court has become a court of appeal in specialized tribunal matters. Hmm. And they are time consuming matters, that's another problem. That's another thing I think which needs a rethink. Uh, but what perturbs me, the very old cases pending in, in every court including the Supreme Court. Okay. Somewhere between the high profile fights, the, the uh, po political difference fights which goes on, the, the Ramlal versus Shamlal gets left behind. And he must know what is the fate of his case. Either he is not worth considering, then it should be out. But it's worth considering, he must get the result. We can't have a scenario where uh, more than 10 years old cases are pending in the Supreme Court, which are not intricate, complicated cases, but the smaller cases. Hmm. So I feel that we should be spending some time on, in some benches, on routine clearances which are pending. I also feel when I touch the old civil appeal, a lot of them just needs to be touched. Touched and, and 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 they will finish off. Some of them by period of time have become infructuous. Some by reason of the uh, um, the litigation fatigue are more inclined to settle the matter. Sometimes the issue is such that you you wonder that uh, at times why were they admitted? So there are many such factors. But we have to see that those cases are put out of the system in some way or the other, uh, so that the common man knows what is the fate of his common case. So do you think that the Supreme Court is you know, turning into, often it turns into a political ba battleground as well because we have heard comments from judges also being made when politically sensitive matters are being heard. Yes, definitely. Even high courts turn that into it. As, as a Chief Justice, I've said public interest litigation used to come before the Chief Justice benches. Uh, there is a battle which is going on, which hmm. the, the focus seems to shift it to the courts. Okay. And I always believe fight your political battle outside. Hmm. Don't try to involve the court in it. If there's a legal issue to it, the court is bound to decide. But the, the friction in the political system today is unfortunately bringing everything before the court. Uh, it's a matter for the, for the political people also to think uh, whether everything and anything should go to the court 
and is this the method of settling the political difference of opinions hmm. um, I, I, I believe there has to be a greater give and take everywhere there has to be uh, acceptance of difference of opinions hmm. uh, can't be my way or highway for anybody I think uh, I, I'm I don't know whether we as, as a whole society and that I'm not talking restricted to India across the world the scenario today is yeah it's a, a lack of tolerance from another point of view hmm. maybe it's the time of the world where this is happening but it's not certainly a desirable situation so 22 years in judiciary have you ever had a moment of trepidation where you felt that I should not have been a part of this no, family no. I've, I've always said I've enjoyed my years at the bar I've enjoyed my years as a judge. If I get another ch opportunity to live my life, I'll possibly live it the same way. I've enjoyed what I've done. Uh, final uh, question is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk which goes around uh, judges accepting post-retirement jobs. Hmm. What do you have to say about that? Uh, it's an individual person, this thing. I, I feel having been the J1 of the Supreme Court, there's not much I would like to do, hmm. but to try to lead a private citizen's life. <laughs> I would prefer to have my freedom after 22 years, uh, do things which I have not been able to do, uh, not necessarily legal work. It's not that you give up the legal work or you don't do other legal concerned work, but for me it's not the sole focus. Okay, well. Happy retired life to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining the print and having such a candid conversation with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank a lot. You.